Hey Donnie, how you doing? What's going on, brother? What's up, Mr. Man? Another day of metal victory, my friend. <laughs> metal victory. Metal victory. So let's talk about Metal Victory. Uh, you guys got the brand new Riot V album coming out, Armor of Light, on April 27th. And uh, you're, you're, you're first for Nuclear Blast, right? This is our first for Nuclear Blast, bro. Um, we're excited about this one. Um, we got the deal on the break, you know, when we were having that little time off after at least the fire. I got to uh, talk to... Uh, What's his name? <laughs> Marcus. Marcus How exciting is that? That's incredible. And uh, you guys have a, a Euro tour coming up with Hammerfall, right? Well, Hammerfall won't be. We've had a lot of offers because, you know, I guess you've seen we're friends with Joe Kim and Hammerfall and Saxon people and all sorts of different bands. So there's been talk in our agent, York, uh, European agent. He's got some stuff brewing right now. Hammerfall was supposed to happen at the end of the year, but by the time they get their record out, it looks like it's going to be the top of next year, like maybe January of 2019. We'll do some European stuff with them and, and stateside stuff. This year, it's looking like at the end of the year, we're doing Primal Fear after all. Um, we started negotiations and then they started fizzling out and then we got a better deal. So we're going to move forward with it. So we'll do like six weeks with them. Um, September, October, yeah. So be a co headline, those cats. That's uh, incredible. You know, and then we're, yeah, it's cool. Um, and then we got the festivals. The, the, the next thing, you know, we just well, we just got back from Japan. You know, I just got home. Uh, we did those Thunder Still 30th anniversary shows, which they're filming for a live TV deal come out in October on Nuclear Blast. Um, we got these festivals coming up in a couple months. Walking, uh, bang yourself in there, and one day I still rock. Um, we're gonna do those, and then they're, they're booking dates around it, like um, the UK, London, and stuff like um, Scotland. And then we have like some more German smash dates, and that'll be coming up like in June, July. So that's kind of what we have now. But Hammerfall will be next year, and Saxon will be later this year. Some possible dates after they get. Yeah, that that's a you know thirtieth anniversary of of Thundersteel, and I, I look back uh, several years ago to when uh, you guys got the Thundersteel lineup back together, and I, I can re I can remember wanting to do an interview with you guys. I think uh, it was a work night when you when you played out in San Antonio with the Thundersteel lineup, but uh, I think that the notable thing about uh, all that is it it almost seems like. You know, when when I saw you in Chicago in 2014 and Riot V was, you know, just starting to play out, it seems like you guys have just consistently stayed probably busier now than uh, when Immortal Soul came out. You know, you just, you guys have been everywhere and it's just like this huge thing. And I see the photos on Facebook of these audiences you guys are playing to. And man, I got to give you props because you guys have really kept the, the, the spirit of the band's music and legacy and Mark's legacy, you know, kept it alive and doing just incredible out there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's cool, man, the way it's, you know, it's going now. I mean, I never expected it would take off like this, um, but, you know, when we reunited, you know, and um, with the shows you're talking about with Tony and Mark before he passed away, you know, it was cool. You know, we had to get everybody together. And, you know, Bobby was down and Mark was down. They approached me first because when they're, they were out with, like, you know, Bobby was out with Hallford, Fix Warning, and whatnot, Smash and Bob, he would say a lot of people are, um, they would always ask him about what's up with Riot Thunder Studio. Y'all should do that. And then Mark got the same thing while he was out with another formation of Riot. And so they approached me about it. And I said, that would be cool, you know. Um, Basically, there's there's two lineups that, that people really dig from Ryan. You know, the Fire Down Under, the old school, and then the Thunder Steel. And, of course, you can't really do a Fire Down Under because Guy's gone. So I said it would 
be cool, but you know, I want to be, of course, be the original guys from that era. And Tony Moore at first wasn't um, real keen on it. He had settled down and got married. And he wasn't really in the metal anymore, so you know, I had a lot of talking to, you know, and negotiating with that guy. And um, he decided to jump aboard. So we did a moral soul with him, basically, with a reunion album which it turned out to be it was supposed to be a little more but he flaked um, and then uh, you know Mark's health started deteriorating so we had a lot of issues in the camp and um, you know I told some other cats um, about the uh, Mortal Soul was almost a riot record without Mark because he only played five uh, I'm sorry played three rhythm tracks only and Mike Funst did all the rhythm tracks and lead solos in that album because he that shape. So, um, at least, you know, at least we got that one out. And then, of course, you know, the next record, um, we did, you know, the Unleash the Fire, which was basically a tribute to Mark. Um, and so, um, that was, you know, the new life after Mark's passing and, and Tony decided not to continue. Uh, and then Bobby was actually going to continue. He was never and he didn't quit. He's just too busy, you know. He's like, I can't record any riot records for another eight months. So I'm busy with the other bands. And he's like, oh, you gotta have something to come out. But, um, you know, um, so after that, I basically got rid of everybody. You know, I kind of took over. I took over the management, which I manage the band now. And um, I just spoke with my, my other original guy and said, hey, we're gonna, you know, this is gonna breathe life, you know. We, we're gonna have to make some adjustments. So rather than getting another management at this point, I had no right like the back of my hand, so I was figuring I knew how to work this band. So, uh, you know, um, I ended up finding Todd Michael Hall, who's an excellent singer. Okay, uh, let, 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 let's touch base on that because it's it's kind of, it's almost comical in a way. If you if you follow you know both bands careers you know first Jack Star leaves Virgin Steel says hey I need a killer singer hooks up with Rhett Forrester and then in, uh, it's almost like you guys paid him back tenfold you know somewhere down the line Riot ends up with Mike Torelli who was Jack Star's singer and then and then now you know uh, you got Todd Michael Hall who came from from Jack Starr's band, so th th that's pretty cool that you guys have got this talent swap going. Which, it's weird, Todd even mentioned that, he's going, do you realize that three singers were with Jack Starr? And I was like, well, the guy's got taste, because he's had some excellent vocalists, and yeah, I remember when Red did the records, because when I first joined, in 1984-ish, Red couldn't, you know, come back. That's why we had the Tyrant for a while, from Jack Panzer. Um, it was me, Sandy, Mark, you know, and Brett was doing his stuff with Jack Starr and his solo records, and, you know, down the line, here we are, and, you know, I hear about Torelli, uh, and then, of course, Todd Michael Hall um, was jamming with him, and I, I believe they have a new record coming out, and Todd did the vocal duties on it just to help him out. It won't be a touring thing, but he's saying on it, but that's why I first saw Todd, too. It's um, a mutual friend of ours, Mark Gabriel, who's like a German metal cat. There's a lot of stuff out there that a label. Um, he turned me on the pod when I said I was looking for someone to cover all the riot bases of theirs. And he sent me a link, and it was Jack Starr. And it was Todd singing, and I was like, wow. So yeah, I saw the connection too. It was kind of strange, but, you know, weird, huh? I like it. It's cool. And I thought that was uh, yeah. such a cool track you guys did for Mark, uh, Until We Meet Again off of Unleash the Fire, strong record, love that record, saw you guys on that tour, and you were killer as always, and um, th this new one is just another monster of a release, you know, I, I like the Thundersteel direction you've been, you've been uh, undertaking the, the more power metal direction of, of Riot, and, and fans are sure gonna love seeing these songs come to life on the road and everything, it's a hell of a record. Yeah, thanks, man. I mean, I, I channeled that because, you know, um, like I said, when I took over after Unleashed the Fire, we had that break for, you know, a few years. And um, that's when I, you know, changed gears and I basically got to deal with nuclear blasts and I knew we had to move in that kind of direction. So I was like, well, you know, um, basically that was, you know, saying goodbye to Mark, Unleashed the Fire, you know, like you said, uh, until we meet again in the song of Mortal Me and Mike Flint's wrote those for Mark. So that was kind of that first record without him. And then, you know, we had to stand basically
from you know from scratch. Like this is us moving forward on nuclear blasts. So you know we needed to channel that. You know Mike Flint. You know if you hear some of the the tracks on Armor Light that are a little more mainstream, it's Rainbow. That's Mike Flint's writing. Um, he channeled his ear of a bribe with Mike DeMeo. And of course, you know, the get up and go stuff. I think the Thunder still vibes. So the, the variety of it between me and Mike, you know, it's, it's a pretty good, well rounded riot record, but it's the tough stuff, you know. It's, um, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> it's, I think people dig that because Thunder still is a well received record, you know. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I could be the proverbial fly on the wall and just hear this story one more time. Um, tell me about Mark comes to Texas, you know, he decides to live down here. Is that right? And he, he gets familiar with the local talent S.A. Slayer, who you were a, a member of a big part of. And, and then you is, is this the, is the chronology, right? You join Narita and then decide to change the name back to Riot when when you uh, came up with the Thundersteel songs? Well, um, what happened is, um, yeah, Mark used to, like, he, he loved San Antonio because of the weather. He was, you know, from New York, he needed the cold weather because Mark liked to jog and camp and all sorts of hike and shit. He was one of those kind of guys. But um, the musical friend of ours, Rick Warhide, was back then when record labels had street teams. I guess they have them now, but it's a little bit different. Street team guy for Riot and Crocus, this guy Rick, and he contacted me because we were great friends. And Slayer rehearsed in his garage. And so he said, hey, you know, Mark Reale from Riot is coming down, and he wants to keep his jobs up. And, you know, and asked if I knew a band. I said, I had a band in my hair in my garage. So that's how I met him. He came down one day and came in the garage, and there he was, you know, we were all fans at that time, you know, we were like, wow, you know, here's Mark Reale, and so he plugged in, and we would just jam Riot songs, Slayer stuff, and he joined us on stage a couple times, and did Swords of Tequila with S.A. Slayer, but uh, that's how I got to beat him, you know, and then through that relationship, he was still in, he was still in Riot, you know, uh, at that time, they were just, they were doing, uh, I think, Born in America, Yeah. and so... They were kind of on hiatus a little bit, you know, at one point. And um, Mark, you know, he would he would actually like, wait, take that back because here's what happened. When we would be jamming, sometimes he would stick around and me, Mark and Dave McLean would like to help him write some tunes. And that's where some of the Born in America stuff came in. We have demos of like me, Dave, and Mark and Cooper doing you know, the original running from the law. Wow. And, and, uh, which ones did we do on the gunfighter? Um, nice. The machine. Yeah. And so I have demos of that with the, the Marina line of actually doing, which later became the Marina line. So he would, he would make a cassette of us recording those songs. Then we take it to the riot camp in New York and they would like listen to them and learn their parts of recording. But, uh, when he did that, he would come back and forth. And so he was down there and he said, hey, you know, let's just start writing some tunes, you know. And of course, my influence from being Slayer, we started writing some pretty powerful stuff, which was Thunder Still and that commercial stuff. But a lot of people don't know that Fire Fall was an early song, um, Crimson Storm. We actually had a little before that because you could hear the version of Crimson Storm with Rat um, from back in the day when I joined the band. So some of the stuff that you hear on Thunder Still was written way before and we just brought it in there but anyway uh, after writing music Mark said hey you know let's let's get out jam let's let's play some shows maybe shop this so it's alright it's a Mark Galley band and then kind of talked about the name and I actually came up with Narita I said dude just name it after the riot right? Narita and he was cool yeah that's cool because he didn't really want to name it after him he thought it was kind of weird so we did that we played some shows and we shopped it we sent it to the riot camp and they shopped it and while they were shopping it, you know, the hiatus came to an end for the Born in America crew. And so Mark said, hey, guys, you know, I'll continue working this and read it. But Sandy called. I got to go. So he left. And, and we were there. And he left. And he joined up with Sandy and all the cats. And that's basically how I think they did. Because when they revamped from the hiatus, they were going to do some more dates. And then Mark called me. He said, hey, dude. 
said, uh, Kip Lemmy didn't want to jam anymore. He was the fucking, you know, that's it. And would you be interested? And I was like, well, yeah, you know? And he was like, okay, well, the guys know you and they know you're a songwriter, so come on out. And we have a few cats auditioning out in California. So I went out there and I jammed with them, you know, and all that crap. And, you know, Mark called me. Oh, that's how I got the gig. Um, so, um, the reader was just a Mark Galley solo project. Um, it wasn't, it didn't really turn into writing the songs eventually it did, but after, uh, you know, I played with Riot maybe before we did all those shows with Brett, Brett joined after the Tyrant left, and, uh, we shot for a deal too, and believe it or not, we were having, you know, a tough time getting a record deal, and so, me and Mark headed back east from L.A., where they were basing the band out of, and, um, it was just me and him. Sandy didn't want to go in that direction. He heard the stuff. He heard Thundersteel, the original version. And he wasn't into that. He wanted to keep the rock style. And then, of course, Red. Red was cool with it. Red, Red actually gave it a fucking try. He just said it wasn't his kind of deal, but he thought it was you know, all right. Sandy had the, the sour taste of his mouth. I'm sure you read. Well, but, um, Red was all for it. I, I so think it's. Basically, where it happened, we, we moved to uh, New York and. Revamped. It's really interesting, like you said, you know, like at one point in time, you and Sandy were, were sharing the stage together. And um, I think that Thundersteel musically is such a departure from Born in America. Maybe not even so much as, you know, it's a different style, but it's definitely a different technical capability. I don't know a lot of drummers that could pull off a, a performance like the one on Thundersteel, just in incredible chops to, to play at that level. Yeah, I mean, technically speaking, I've never thrown that in Sandy's face, you know, when we argue, I'm sure you've seen the riffraff, but yeah, technically speaking, Sandy couldn't play this stuff. It's ridiculous. You know, when you have someone like Bobby Joe Zombeck, I mean, he's the monster of the band. Even Mark Edwards, who played on four songs on Thunderstone, was from Steeler. Um, I ended up getting him into Ride the same way I got Harry. Conklin and my at the time. I had a vinyl collection of metal. You know how we were back in the day? We had vinyl, you know? Yeah. And, you know, when we needed a vocalist, when Rhett couldn't do it, Mark was like, you know anybody? And I stuck through my vinyl. I said, dude, this cat from Jack Tanner's great. And he heard him, he said, he's cool. And that's how he got in the band. And then down the line, when me and Mark went up to New York to start the Thundersteel uh, lineup, um, Bobby wasn't available. You know, I actually thought about him. Um, he was doing so I don't know if he was doing Jerk or not he was doing something else so I got through my vinyl again and I was like well who's going to be a good double bass because at that time we had been writing heavy songs and needed to we, we, we planned how Thunderstone was going to sound we wanted to Mark knew that the rock thing was cool but at the time the new wave of British heavy metal and Priest and Maiden were out and Mark said you know to keep up with the Joneses we really need to change gears I think you know to get up there and that's kind of why I wrote you know eight out of the nine songs on Thunderstone because he really wanted it to be fast and aggressive so anyway so when we're thinking about a drummer you know I went through the vinyl and I thought well the guy that played with Dean Dave Kill Steel he's got to be good and I contacted Mark Edwards and he pulled up and he's the guy on four of the songs and then you know of course he went back to Lion and the Doug Aldridge and Cal Swan they had a band he went back and then Bobby was free while he flew up and did the rest of the record. Um, but yeah, you know, Sandy, you know, I have respect for the cat because, you know, he, he played on, you know, one of the biggest riot records besides Thunder Still Fired on Under. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I can't really explain. I've, I've talked to interviewers about it too. And I'm like, I don't know. And a couple of interviews caught him in lies. So they're like, well, yeah, we know he's lying because he claims he doesn't even know you. Right. And, um, it's weird because when I first joined Riot, I lived with him. Like when I flew down to LA and they hired me, instead of putting me in a hotel, I lived with him and his wife, Mimi. His wife's name was Mimi. And I lived in their guest bedroom but for the whole time, including my tech. And Rhett stayed there for a while. And we hung out, you know, and we were friends. And of course, we played shows and there's pictures of us playing live and recording. <laughs> you know, he just, he just, I, I think he's got a, you know, bad taste in his mouth, you know, and I don't know how to explain it, you know. I don't try to be weird with the guy. He he kind of comes at us, 
you know, in a, in a horrible manner. I mean, you know, like I've always told people, I don't mind opinions. You're like, hey, I don't like that fast ride. I like the old school ride. Hey, man, that's cool, man. More power to you. I love it, too. But he comes out like he was the only guy. His era was the only era, and he's forgetful, you know. And then he has, of course, his little army of people attacking us, saying, you know, we're this and that. So... I'm just like, okay, dude, whatever, the proof is in the pudding, you know. You're a keyboard gangster and you're not doing anything in Riot 5 is, you know, doing everything on their own, playing the world, you know, so. Anyway, yeah, so, that being said, you know, whatever, I, I stopped arguing with the guy. I gave him too much attention when I'd argue with him. <laughs> so, well, um, anyway. and it, 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 this band, the Texas Metal, but this band called the Texas Metal Outlaws, they did a great version of Running from the Law, didn't they? <laughs> sure did, yeah. We'll hear more from them soon. And it, it, it seems like there's kind of been a open door policy. Is, is you know you talked about the there's not you know just one definitive riot lineup, but you you've you know you had a uh, what Lou Cavares come up on stage with you in in San Antonio, and you know if, if other guys wanted to, to take part in in what you. What, what you guys are doing, you know, the celebrating the music of Riot, you know, it seems like you guys have been pretty open about that. It's unfortunate that uh, not everyone's on board with that, but um, uh, another big honor for, for Riot was the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame induction. Uh, I can only imagine it must have been, you know, how do you even sit down to prepare to write an induction speech? It's like one of the biggest moments of your musical career. I mean, were your nerves shot? Were, were you excited more than anything? Like, what was going through your head? I was uh, freaked out at first because um, one of my agents, booking agents, contacted me and said, hey, there's this heavy metal hall of fame in the States uh, here. They want to induct Riot. And I was like, he said, I don't know which is real, what it's about. I said, okay, let me look into it, you know. So, of course, I was freaked out. I said, well, wow, what is this? So I tried to call the cat a couple times. I finally got in touch with him. This guy, Pat Lasaldo, turns out that him and some people uh, had a hand at the real Hall of Fame in Cleveland, and um, they were tired of the that committee always putting in rap bands rather than rock bands. They were kind of frustrated. So they decided to get some sponsors like the Drones with Disabilities and Wendy Dio's Cancer Fund and put together this. So, you know, the first one, of course, they had, you know, Wendy and, and Randy and Dio and stuff like that. Um, Lost so the boss. I researched it. Yeah, so... Uh, they had, yeah, they had Ross in there, they had, you know, uh, some other cats in there, and I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. And so, I knew it was real, so when I talked to the guy, um, I said, hey, wow, thanks, this is real, you know who we are, you're not talking about Riot Riot, you're talking about Riot, what era, what are you talking about? And he, you know, he, he knew the whole history of the band, who said that the committee is him, uh, Eddie Trunk, and some journalists, so, and they picked Riot, and so... Then I was like, okay, it's for Riot. And he said, yeah. You know, y'all, y'all are one of the originators of, you know, that era, you know, hard rocking and, you know, and stuff. So then I asked him, I said, okay, well, you you want the old guys? You want Fire Down Under? He said, no. He said, we got a list. We made a list. And so he sent me the list, and I was on it. He said they were celebrating the, basically the induction was two lineups. It was Fire Down Under and Thunder Still. That's what it was. And then they included a couple other cats. So they asked me if I should add me on. They, you know, asked my opinion, and I said, "Well, I said to be honest with you, you know, um, you might want to induct Peter Vitelli. He named the band, and Luke Cavar, so those are the original guys." Um, I said, "You got everybody else covered with, you know, Fire Down Under." I even gave props to Sandy. You know, not once did I ever pull the plug on him. What happened with Sandy was he was making threats. Um, had to call me up and say, hey, there's an old drummer that's flipping out. And I said, yeah, I know who it is. And he said, what's up with the guy? And I said, I don't know. He goes, well, what do I do? I said, it's up to you, dude. I said, you know, if he shows up, I'll be cool. You know, and I said, but, you know. Um, and then Pat said, dude, this is like a benefit for, you know, disabilities and Wendy Dio and we got a lot of sponsors, Wounded Warriors. It's not something we want to have drama with. So he's the one that addressed maybe Sandy shouldn't come. We'll send him a trophy. And I was like, how do you want to handle it? But anyway, yeah, I uh, I talked to Lou. Like you said, I was friends with Lou and Rick already. They had Jan with us, and I told, told them that they were on the list. And 
said, you know, that, uh, you know, we're all inducted, and I sent everybody the list. And so four of us went out there, me, Mike Flintz, representing our ears, and then Rick in L.A. went out there um, representing their ears. And, um, you know, that was it. We flew out there. We uh, accepted. It was crazy because I was standing next to Bill Ward. Wow. I told Bill Ward, I shook his hand, and I said, dude, this trophy I'm holding means a lot. I said, but you know what means more than this trophy? Getting inducted with you. I said, that's the award. I said, you're Bill Ward. And yeah. He said, thank you, man. I appreciate it. So, you know what I mean? I mean, God. I'm including with Bill Ward. Get the fuck out of here. I'm that's not fucking working. awesome, man. <laughs> so, anyway, so I think they know Sandy their trophy. So, I gave Peter Bicelli his because he actually lives in New Braunfels, the original drummer that was on Rock City and Narita. It's in freaking New Braunfels now. Um, and then, um, of course, Red Forrester, I got his. And I mailed it to his estate. And then, you know, the other guys took Mark and, and all of them. And so I think Sandy and, and Chip got their mail to them somehow. So, you know. Wow. Got, you know, even, in my, even in my speech, if you look at my speech, I thank Sandy, you know. Yeah. So. No, I I know there's no animosity towards Sandy on your part, just beyond having to respond to the constant back and forth and everything. It's just sad situation, you know, not taking away anything from anybody. All the lineups of Riot are great in my opinion, and too bad everyone can't get along. But what a what a special moment! I was so proud of you guys, you know, seeing seeing you guys get the award. And if any band in metal deserves it, definitely Riot. You know, I, I think one of the strongest catalogs in all of metal has got to be Riot. And oh, it's so cool that what started out as, you know, a, a New York band, it almost, you know, it almost feels kind of Texas-based. You know, you think about Mark is, is buried out in San Antonio and you're hailing from San Antonio and you got a new song on the new record called San Antonio. So I love it. co-writer on that with me that's that's his opening riff and so we thought it, it was called something else and bobby actually played drums on it but frankie relayed the drums and we uh, restructured it but uh, mark's on the credits uh, frankie actually came up with the idea who would have thought that the drummer from new jersey you know said you know hey I, it sounds like san antonio and blah so you know of course we thought about the same thing that we have a lot of history Mark has a lot of history here, and that's where uh, I met him, and he's buried here, and he loved the city, and, you know, of course, San Antonio is a great, you know, town for riot. It always has been since back in the day. So we all pitched in on the lyrics and everything, and that's why it's on there. You know, it's kind of a tribute to Mark and the town, so, yeah, it's kind of crazy, huh? Is, is it kind of, like, bi-coastal, like... Walk me through when you guys are writing, when you're demoing, when you're practicing for a tour. Does Mike come down to SA, or is it primarily you going up to New York, or how does that work? I go to New York. Um, but everybody else is up in New York. Um, Todd's based out of Michigan some of the time, but with his business, he's there a lot in New York. Um, so yeah, Frank, Nick, and Mike live in New York, so Ryan's basically still based out of there after all these years. So basically have a tour or when we have a festival I fly up about you know five days to a week ahead of time and uh, we rehearse up there um, and then we fly from JFK to Europe back to JFK and then I'll fly back to Texas uh, but yeah all rehearsals and everything are done up there um, so we'll do a little bit of pre-production but a lot of it you know because of technology you know yeah. for me and you were sending files that's how we do it in Riot you know we'll I'll demo all my stuff. You know, I got a drum machine and I lay bass. I do everything actually. I do drum machine, bass, guitar rhythms, guitar leads, dual leads, and vocals I'm not real good at, but I'll have a melody for Todd and I just send them out to the guys and they basically do their magic to it, you know, and um, and so we'll do we'll do that from our own homes where we live. Uh, but everything else is based out of New York. Nice. Yeah, I, I liked seeing the the photo of Mark's dad at ninety years old with the with the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame trophy. 
What a special photo. Um, so, pardon, pardon me, uh, you, you guys may have something in the works, and I'm just, you know, f it's flying under the radar for me. Um, and this is my nerd question of the interview. You know, you talked about uh, Mark coming out and playing shows with you guys when you were still Slayer, and, you know, you talked about these demos you guys made, and being that it's the 30th anniversary of, of Thunder Steel, Tell me Nuclear Blast has some kind of three CD collection in the works with deluxe liner notes and digipack artwork. And, you know, is there anything like that it, it planned for the 30th anniversary of one of the greatest metal albums ever? There's a few things planned. Like I said earlier, well, um, the DVD will come out in October of what we just did. Uh, the new, you know, the My Riot Live lineup doing the... Uh, um, I don't know if you saw it. We did the album from Thunderstill to the very end, Dirty Alive in order. And uh, they filmed it. They had like 20 cameras out there, so the professional one. Um, and we did the whole record with a big stage show. You know, we had the little Mighty Cures come out and all sorts of shit. Anyway, that, that'll come out um, celebrating the year of uh, 30th anniversary DVD in October. As for uh, something else, I think we'll have some live discs coming out down the line, but Right now, nuclear blast. The only thing we did um, is, you know, I'm not sure how much of the record you've heard. If you heard the new Thunder Steel, did you hear that or no? There's a new Thunder Steel. Yeah. Uh, what happened? I don't know. Um, Marcus came up with the idea for nuclear blast. Like the original plan was for us to release the album yesterday on the 30th anniversary of Thunder Steel. Armor of Light was supposed to come out March 24, so they could say 30 years later. But of course, because of business and recording and production and the whole nine yards, you know how everything gets pushed back all the time. That's what happened. So it didn't come out. So anyway, his plan was, he said, you know what, I think you guys should do Thunder Still. You know, and I was a little apprehensive, you know, because I did write it with Mark. And I said, well, that's such an iconic song. It's always dangerous. And he said, dude, you're the main songwriter. You know, you should be proud. 30th anniversary. And I said, you know what, you're right. So, uh, after that, uh, recording the whole record, we did Thunderstone like a week, literally. I told the guys, they want a, they want a version of Thunderstone. So Frankie recorded the drums in two days. Um, and the bike was about to go to Florida with this other band he does. And he recorded the guitars in two days. And then I think Nick spent a little more time with it. And of course, you know, Todd Michael Hall cut everything in, in a day. Because, you know, we played the song all the time live, so it's like the back of our hands so recording in the studio didn't take no time at all. So recording and, and, and mixing it, it took like less than five days to a week. But it's on there. It'll be the last song. It's a bonus track, so um, you're getting different versions. I think the regular version might not have it. The Digipack comes with two bonus tracks, and Thunder Still is one of the bonus tracks. And when I listen to it, it's... Incredible. I mean, it sounds like Riot in 1988. I mean, Todd, the liver sounds like us young, you know. I'm, you know, I'm the old guy, but, you know, it sounds like a fresh Riot. You know, it sounds great. I put a little breakdown in the, uh, in the little breakdown part. Uh, I make a little Pantera part in there, and then we do the end like we do live when Todd does an acapella thing, and then we end it. So it's, it's a little fresh, a couple new parts, but it sounds really cool. So that's on there. And then the DVD will come out. So, you know, that's commemorating um, the 30th year. So that's kind of cool, man. I didn't know if you had it, but they sent that link. Well, okay, yeah, I got the promo link, but unfortunately, the bonus track's not on there. So I'm just going to have to wait like everyone else. But, yeah, I definitely can't wait to check that out. Cool. I might be able to send it to you. <laughs> Rad, yeah. Well, hey, Donnie, I know you have a... Uh, I know Nuclear Blast has got you really busy today with all the interviews going on, and thank you so much for taking the time to do this for Metal Rules, and you sure have a lot of uh, excited metal fans that come to our website that love Riot, so thanks again, and look forward to, to seeing you guys out on the road, man. Metal Rules, man, so do you, Rob. <laughs> so do you, Donnie. <laughs> have a good one, brother. All right, you too, man. Take care.